Welcome to the Danny Carlson Podcast, your resource for growing the business and mindset for a life of unrestricted freedom. Now here's your host, online marketing acrobat, Danny Carlson. What's up, guys? Danny Carlson here, and this is an episode of the Danny Carlson Podcast where we are going into building virtual teams, and that is something that's been really beneficial to me in my businesses, and I've known this guy for quite a while, and he's very qualified to talk about the subject because he recently has sold a business that is all about hiring virtual assistants from the Philippines and just hiring the actually good talent instead of the talent that says they're good when they're actually not good. Believe me, that's a big problem. So I'm really excited to dive into this one and really, you know, what can you do to hire really good team members from the Philippines and scale cost effectively instead of hiring someone who's probably five, four or five times the price in your home country. So welcome to the podcast, Nathan Hirsch. How's it going, man? Yeah, doing great, man. How are you? Very, very good. So let's just start. Like, What are some of, I know you probably can't share a lot of the major details when it comes to the sale, but like, what was the, the details surrounding the sale of your business free up? Yeah, I mean, I love free up. I continue to love free up. I'm now a client of free up, so it's, it's that part's a little bit weird. Uh, but I mean, at, towards the end of 2019, one of our clients, the Hoth, who had been a longtime client of free up, approached us. They said, "Hey, we we love the service. We love free up. We want to get into the freelancer space. We don't want to start from scratch. Would you be interested in an acquisition?" And going through Connor and I just past conversations. I mean, we're both pretty logical people. There's only so many ways you you run a business, right? You either run it forever, you get funding, which I personally don't want to do. I don't want to work for someone else or feel like I'm working for someone else. You run into the ground or you sell it. So one of the, the four options there. So we, we heard them out. We listened to their offer. It was more than fair. We thought even aggressive and we did a lot of due diligence, just like they were doing due diligence on us. They wanted to learn every little part of the business before they invested their money. Uh, we wanted to learn everything about them, all their success, their failure, how they treat their team. And we got to go to their office. Their office is actually an hour and a half for me in Tampa and, and meet the, the people that would be taking it over. And I think they've won employer of the year, like four years in a row or something like that in Tampa. Um, so they treat people well. They, they've bought a lot of companies. They have a lot more experience scaling businesses from that eight figure mark or 10 million mark up to 50 million mark that, than we do. So, um, and we want to make sure that people are taken care of. So we negotiated uh, putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars of the sale to go towards our team in the Philippines and take care of them. And once we kind of got through the, the mind numbing part, which was the, the attorneys going back and forth, which wasn't really our fault or, or their fault, they, the attorneys were just doing their thing. Um, we decided to, to make that decision to make the move. I mean, it's tough to turn down something that you saw was a, a win for us, a win for them, a win for the internal team and hopefully a win for the clients and the freelancers on the platform going forward. So definitely tough. I, I know when we told our, our team in the Philippines, they were emotional, they were crying, we got emotional, but we think that they're taken care of because of it. And long-term, it's going to be a, a good situation for everyone. Well, that's excellent. I think most entrepreneurs would be lying if they said that they would turn down an offer for the business if it was the right amount of money, right? I mean, that is the dream for a lot of the entrepreneurs and potential entrepreneurs listening to this podcast. I think a good place to start before we really dive into the meat of the general virtual assistance and you know how to's and everything like that, maybe let's talk a bit about organic scaling because that's something I know you did really well when you were growing free up ways of growing the company without spending a bunch of money on ads and you know hoping that it works. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll add before that is don't just focus on the money with the scale. I mean, obviously the money has to make sense. It has to be good and a fair valuation, but you don't want to sell your business to someone that you're going to spend the next five to 10 years arguing with, or that is going to drive your business in the ground, or that's going to hurt your reputation or the, the partnerships and the relationship that you've built. So there are other factors besides the money and, and why we spent so much time on the due diligence, uh, just something for the, the listeners to, to keep in mind. But yeah, I mean, my, my mentality on organic scaling is to set a baseline. I mean, obviously you need a, a good service, a good product, product. If you don't have that, you can only do so much, but create a referral program, create an affiliate program, have it on your website. If you're a service-based business, every time you get off the phone with a client, tell them about your referral program. Hey, by the way, before I let you go, did you know we have XYZ program? And make sure it makes sense. Make sure that it's valuable to them. Our last year of free up, we paid out $250,000 in affiliate money and we may let everyone know about it. It was a big part of the business from the beginning. From there, now that you have the baseline of the good service and the affiliate program, I try to network with three new entrepreneurs every single day. It's the first thing I do every single morning. Reach out to them on Facebook, on Instagram, 
try to avoid LinkedIn just because you get caught up in, in all those spam messages. Um, but you're not trying to pitch them. You're not trying to sell them. You're just trying to, to set up networking calls. And in those calls, you hear about their business. You tell them about your business. Um, you're, and if there's some way for you to work together, add value, great. And if not, expanding your network is a great part of being an entrepreneur. It's a, it's a high value add. They might run into someone who needs your service down the line at a conference, at an event, whatever it is. So, and if you continue to network with three new people every day, you're going to look back years later and be like, wow, my network is huge. That has expanded. So that's kind of the, the low hanging fruit, what doesn't take a ton of effort to just get on the phone with people for 15 minutes and, and set that stuff up. But the Let's next just step, pause there for a second. Like, how are you yeah. reaching out to these people here? Are you just like kind of cruising through Facebook and looking for people who um, they have clearly optimized profiles that could potentially have the same target audience as you? You just send them a DM. Uh, like, what are you saying? Yeah, great question. So I try to look for people that I have some kind of connection with. So it's not just some random person I'm reaching out to. For example, if I go on your podcast, I might go and I'll hire a VA to do this. Go get me a list of everyone that's been on Danny's podcast before. And I won't reach out to all of them in the same day, but over time, I'll reach out and just say, be like, hey, we'd love to connect. We were on the same show or it could be the same event or it could be the same Facebook group, whatever. Try to find a common interest, a common friend, whatever it is. You don't want to just be reaching out to people out of the blue that you have no friends in common, absolutely nothing in common. That, that's kind of my overall strategy. Yeah, I think that's really smart. I recently did that for um, Global Sources. It's an event in Amazon space that got canceled because of the coronavirus. And I got my VA to reach out to all of them on LinkedIn and be like, hey, I know you're going to speak at Global Sources. Do you want to speak on my podcast instead? And the response cool. rate of a message like that is very, very high, well above 80%. <laughs> exactly. And you can, you'll, if you're on social media all the time, you'll see common people in groups. You'll see people post stuff that you might be able to relate to. So it doesn't always have to be a, a direct DM, but it definitely is a good way to just get the day started and continue to connect with people. And you can't take it personally. If someone says no, or someone ignores you or whatever it is, you move on. That, that's part of life. And just stay away from any kind of aggression, aggression or being pushy. Absolutely. And I know you got some more organic scaling tips for us here. What else you got? Yeah. So next we look for partnerships. So we look for people in the space that offer something different than what we offer, but have the same target audience. So for free up the first year we were targeting Amazon sellers. We eventually moved on to marketing agencies and other stuff like that, but we looked for other Amazon software companies and we really partnered with almost all of them in the space. And we did it through content partnerships. We said, Hey, we have a community of people we're building that are perfect for your software vice versa. Let's do a podcast together. Let's do a YouTube video. Let, let us write a guest article for your blog. Let's do it vice versa. Let's do an email blast, social media post, whatever it is. And the way that you kind of add value is you keep it organized. So you get a VA, you set it up. So it's like, Hey, we're going to do content swaps once a year, once a quarter, once a month, whatever it is that makes sense for you. And then that, that you can actually handle based on, on what your team can produce. And you're the one that schedules it. You're the one that reaches out. Hey, it's been six months. What do you want to do together? And if they need to skip one time, no big deal. If it's going great and you want to increase the frequency, that's fine too. But get in the habit of those content swaps. Great for SEO, great for networking, great for just getting in front of more people in your target audience. Next is putting out your own content. Uh, pretty key in today's world. Um, set up some kind of schedule so you're making multiple posts on multiple channel every single day. I like to write my posts on Sunday and then can just copy and paste them throughout the week. Although if something comes up, I might write my own that day if it comes to the top of mind. Um, and then podcasts are key. Just going on podcasts. I know you know the value of, of going on podcasts and having your own podcast, but it's great for networking. It's great for SEO. It's great for brand recognition. It's great for getting in front of your target audience. And the last one, which is the harder one, is the going after influencers. And I think everyone tries to go after the, the Ezra Firestones of the world and the, what I call the type A influencers, but focus on the, the C, the Ds, the people with Facebook groups or, or coaches or small communities of your target audience and start building relationships with them and try to add value to their communities and kind of work your way up towards those, those higher level names. So it, overall, that's kind of my overall strategy. And obviously there, there's um, a lot that goes into it, but you can just start with step one of building out your referral program and then reaching out to people. And then maybe once a month you reach out to partners and as you can handle more and more volume, just continue to chip away in that list. Yeah. There's some really powerful strategies there. And a lot of those are exactly what we have used to grow Kenji ROI. Um, I just like to touch on something you said there 
um, we actually kind of mix the strategies of podcasting and doing those relationships with other companies in our space. Very often, the people that we are interviewing on the podcast, they also have that software company with the same target client. They have that service-based company. And then so reaching out to them and offering to have them on our podcast has an incredibly high success rate. You just like reach out, hey, I, I see that you put out some really interesting content. Do you want to be on our podcast and speak to our audience about that? That is a great way to open a conversation that then will lead to, hey, do you want to do some guest posting? Instead of just coming straight to them and asking, do you want to collaborate? Blah, 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 blah. It's got a much, much lower response rate that way. Yeah, and, and let me kind of go off of that. So the power of having a podcast, there was this influencer that I reached out to, got rejected, got rejected, got rejected for I don't even know how long. Maybe I reached out to her four or five times over the course of two years. Well, I launched a podcast for free up. We sold it with the so I, we sold it with the acquisition, so I no longer have it. But the second I launched the podcast, we hadn't even gotten any viewers yet. We had just started it. That that influencer reached out to me and said, "Hey, can I be on your podcast?" So it just kind of shows just the power of having a podcast. It, it's huge nowadays. Oh, absolutely. And that's one funny thing. So many people ask me. It's like, "Hey, Danny, how do you get these famous people on your podcast?" And the answer is. Nobody asks how many downloads you get. Nobody. Like I, I literally less than 10% of my guests have ever asked that question. And this podcast, like I've had the Actualized Freedom podcast for 80 some episodes now. So that's pretty well established. But this podcast, the Danny Carlson podcast, I think it was episode two was a guy named Jay Sims. And he's a best selling author. He's, you know, speaking all over the time and he's pretty in demand. And I just got an intro from some random person I met somewhere and Jay just immediately agreed to be on the podcast without asking any other questions. And there was only one episode live, I think, at the time. If he actually even opened the podcast app and looked, he would only see one episode in there. And he still just immediately said yes. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of how easy it is. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. And if you're listening out there, try to get on other podcasts. Like that should be part of your marketing strategy. You don't have to be like me and just go crazy and be on as many podcasts as you can, but try to be on one a week, two a month, whatever it is. And over time, you can figure out what works, what doesn't work. You'll get good at it. I remember my first few podcasts, I bombed. They didn't go well. It happens. You learn from it and you move forward. Awesome. So I think this is a good time to transition into virtual assistance. And you kind of mentioned during some of those processes, you're using virtual assistants at certain parts of that process. So maybe that's a good place to start. Like what parts of the processes that you're mentioning are you outsourcing to virtual assistants or overseas workers? Yeah, pretty much everything that I just mentioned, I'm using VAs for. Besides the networking calls, I'm usually reaching out to people on that, although I'll use VAs to sometimes combine a list. Think of kind of every process as 100%, and I'm probably using VAs for the first 70 to 80% of every single pro process. So for podcasts, I might find someone in the industry who's going on a lot of good podcasts, and I'll say, hey, go find me every podcast that person's been on, and then I'll give the VA certain criteria. So I'll say, how many downloads? How, what's their social media following? I actually do check that stuff only because I go on a lot of podcasts. And then the next thing, I'll, it'll, hey, I've been on it before, so I don't look like an idiot pitching someone who I've already been on their podcast. So I'll have the VA double check that um, and then I'll take it home. So once I get that list, I'll go through it and I'll say, hey, I'm going to reach out to these four and then I have templates that I'll adjust and send to them. So the VA does the first 80%. I do the last 20. Very similar on partnerships. I'll say, hey, find me every Amazon software company and then I'll go through and I'll say, hey, these are the ones we work with. Let's remove them. Let's contact the other one. So you can use it to get you that first head start. I What I don't recommend doing, especially if you've never used a VA before or you haven't spent a lot of time training your VA, is just have them do everything. Don't be like, hey, go find me podcasts and go pitch them and let me know when you're done. That's probably not going to turn out too well. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to echo that sentiment too. In the past, I've definitely spent a lot of time trying to come up with the perfect system, the perfect standard operating procedure that a virtual assistant can just be responsible for and they can handle the entire thing. And for some things, that's fine. You know, there's no reason why a virtual assistant can't do the whole process, but there right. is a heck of a lot of things that just require that certain level of nuance that is going to need one, a native English speaker, and two, someone who is just you know, has your specific special juice, your specific knowledge, right? There's certain things that it's very hard for you to transfer that knowledge. Like you said, like it would take a virtual assistant a lot longer to know if they have, you know, if you've done a guest post with that company before, if you've been on their podcast before, all these different relationships that you instantly know in your brain, they're going to have to go digging for that and they might make a mistake, right? 
Right. And it happens. It happens to even the best VAs. I had a VA who was doing my lead generation for podcasts at FreeUp and she's awesome. She crushed it. And there was one influencer that she really pissed off. She just made a mistake. We all do it. She pitched that influencer like three times in the same week by accident. And I reached out to the influencer. I, I gave her my apologies. I explained it. And I actually have a great relationship with the influencer going forward. They're an affiliate of, of Outsource School, my new venture. So just because there are mistakes along the way doesn't mean that you can't just own up to it, take responsibility for it, and turn it into a positive going forward. Yeah, it certainly makes a lot of sense. And I have a, I have a really powerful question for you because this is, I think, the most important thing when it comes to hiring virtual assistants overseas is how do you find the good ones? What is your process for weeding out the ones who say that they're good from the ones who are good? Right. So we call it our IOTA method. So it's IOTM and that stands for interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing. So I'll kind of go through the, the biggest mistakes I see at each stage. For interviewing, the biggest mistake is just focusing on their skill and experience and not focusing on their attitude and their response time during interviews. So I like to do interviews via Slack. You use Skype. Slack's a lot better now. Uh, but you get to go through and have a conversation with them. I don't use video. I get to see how quickly they respond, how they understand my English, how they actually write. Um, but then I also get to want to learn about their attitude. What are they motivated by? Are they motivated by money? Are they motivated by security? Are they motivated by learning more and, and increasing their education? and figuring out who has that great attitude of someone I want to work with. Because you can always teach more skill. Very, very tough to teach attitude. For onboarding, most entrepreneurs just skip that whole step altogether. If they interview three virtual assistants and they want to hire Jane and they want to hire Jane at five bucks an hour, they interview her, they say, hey, Jane, you're hired at five bucks an hour. Let's jump into training. And for me, we call it our sick method. So it's schedule, issues, communication, and culture. And we're gonna offer Jane five bucks an hour and we're gonna say, hey, before you accept that, let's go through your schedule and make sure that there's no issues there. Let's go through issues, which is communication, internet, and power. And do you have a backup plan? How often do you lose it? What's realistic here? We go through communication. This is how we use Slack. This is how we use Viber. This is what's expected of you to respond to an email within 24 hours. And then we go through culture, what's expected with communicating with the team, my business partner, values, beliefs. And then we give them a chance to back out because I would much rather they back out because we're not on the same page with expectations than to accept that job and then two months down the line, it causes issues. So if you take anything away from this is don't forget to onboard and set expectations with the virtual assistant. And then to wrap it up, the training, the biggest mistake I, I may see is people not valuing their own time during the training, doing like one-on-one -on -one training for two weeks, then they realize the VA is not a fit, but they've already invested two weeks into them and do they keep going, do they start over? Instead, give someone an SOP, have them study it, have them learn it without you, ask questions, and then test them, make sure they actually get it. And if they know 80% of it, sure, get them that last 20%. But if they only know 30% of it, part ways, pay them for their time, move on, and you lost a little bit of money, but you didn't waste your time. And then management, getting them to actually buy in and building the relationship so that once you've invested the time, the energy, and the money into someone, they actually stick around for years to come. Yeah, I absolutely love that too. I think expectations is something really to echo there is in the past, I've had so many problems when it comes to not setting the right expectations with the virtual assistants and especially when it comes to how much time that they're dedicating. If you in your brain you are expecting them to be working certain hours, like a certain number of hours and during certain times of the day and being available to talk to you at certain times, then that must be clearly communicated because maybe they have different expectations. They think that it's flexible and they can log on whenever they want. And then you're getting mad at them because they're not online when you want them to be, but they have no idea because you did not communicate that, right? Do you think it's a good idea to have um, just like an onboarding template document that entrepreneurs can send out to any new virtual assistants that they hire? Yeah, we've, we've done that before. I personally like to kind of go through it with them because I can kind of tell if they're hesitant or if they're they're hundred percent gung ho about it rather than just saying, Oh, do you agree to everything here? Okay, let's move forward. Something might get missed. You can do it that way. The onboarding that, that we teach that we show at outdoor school, it usually takes between 15 to 30 minutes. So for you to spend 15 to 30 minutes to really make sure someone's a good hire, to me, that's a good investment of my time because that's going to save me a lot of hours down the line. And 
let's take schedule for example. If I want someone to work nine to five Eastern time, well, that's nine a nine p.m. to five a.m. Filipino time. If there's no daylight saving, so I want I need to make sure that person's okay with it. I want to know, hey, have you worked that before? Why do you think you can work that? Or what what's going on outside of work that could affect that? And I want to make it super clear to them that if they come to me in two months and say, hey, nine to five doesn't work for me, then you probably don't have a job because that's the time that I need you to work. So. We need to get on the same page right now that you're 100 percent good with it before we move over, move on to the next question. Absolutely, and I just want to quickly ask, like, what are the biggest red flags that you're screening for uh, when you're hiring virtual assistants? I know for me personally, one of them is that they actually have the capacity. There's a lot of virtual assistants out there that will say that they are able to work full time. You know, I can take on these hours. I have this, but. In, reality, they actually have a full-time job somewhere else, or sometimes they're working like 50 hours a week and they will just say yes to whatever you ask, right? So like, how do you, how do you screen for these things and what are you screening for? The big red flags. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the biggest ones for me. I want to know not necessarily who exactly their clients are, although I'll ask them like, who, who are your clients and what hours do you work for them? Are they set or they set or they set or flexible schedule? I want to know, Hey, do you have another client Five hours a week flexible, I don't care. Am I your second 40 hour a week client? I definitely care. And I also want to set that expectation that when you're working for me, you can't be working for someone else. You can't be outsourcing your work to someone else. And if either of those things happen or I suspect them ha happening, then your job just ends right there. So really setting that expectation that you need to get the full information and you take that stuff incredibly seriously. The second thing, and I mentioned the, the three types of issues before, computer, internet, and power. How old is your computer? How fast is it? If your computer breaks, does that mean that you can't work for the next two months or does your brother and sister have a backup that you can use? Same thing for internet and power. How often do you lose internet and power? If they tell me, oh, we lose it once every two months and the first week they work for me, they lose it three times, I'm gonna say, whoa, whoa let's take a step back. This is what you told me, let's get on the same page here. Do they have a phone that they can use a hub spot, uh, hotspot from? Do they have a backup internet or backup generator? Do they have a friend's house they can go to, or is it something where if power goes out, they can't work, they can't go anywhere until it comes back? I want to know all those things before we get started on day one. And so, like, to basically screen for that, I know personally from spending time in the Philippines, there are just certain areas of the Philippines that have poor internet in general, and they have a little less reliable electricity and things like that. Do you automatically screen for that based on location, or, or do you not really care? You just really based on whatever they can provide? Yeah, so great question. If someone came to me at free up and was like, oh, I've had this issue with VAs all the time, it's always their internet, it's always their power, then I would recommend, okay, like, let's stop hiring people in rural areas, let's hire more people in the city, you'll probably overall have less issues. I personally don't do that, I hire VAs from both places. For me, it's just setting that expectation. I wanna know going in how often you really lose it and what happens when you do lose it. Because there are situations where an entire internet power, entire power goes down for the entire town and there's nothing people can do. They can't go work. They can't go to a friend's house. But I need to know what that situation is. And it might affect, it might not affect me hiring them or not, although it could depending on how bad it is. But maybe it just affects what job I give them. Maybe I give them something that isn't as urgent. Or maybe I just don't make them a team leader and I make someone else a team leader who has a backup generator in their house. So it doesn't, it might not necessarily affect the hiring decision, but it could also affect the responsibilities down the line. I've had rock star VAs that lost internet, lost power here and there. It happens. They texted us right away. They communicated. They went to a friend's house and worked and it was no big deal. And I've had other VAs that did everything possible. They had a backup plan, but sometimes backup plans fail and they just didn't work. And we talked, we talked it out. It was their situation. They couldn't do that much about it. And we changed up what tasks they were doing and when they were responsible for it. So that information is what's powerful. And then you can decide to tweak your business depending on what, what information you get. Awesome. That's a super, super powerful tip there, guys. Super, super powerful. And when it comes to VAs, what other just general advice do you have for people? I know we've covered a lot of things here already, but what do you think is the most important thing that you haven't covered so far on this episode? Yeah, I'm a big fan of diversifying. I learned a lesson early on by hiring one person to do everything and I spent six months training them and one day they just quit on me. So it was six months of training down the drain and I just see a lot of entrepreneurs, they, they kind of fall into this habit of they, they make some bad hires, they finally find someone they like, they load that person up with everything and then 
that person quits, that person gets sick, that person gets pregnant, whatever it is, and they don't realize that their entire business is really dependent on this one person. So over time, you gotta figure out ways to departmentalize. You don't have to go crazy if you're getting 10 emails a day, you don't have to hire three customer service reps, but maybe instead of hiring one customer service rep at 40 hours a week, maybe hire two for 20, have them cover for each other. No one works 365 days a year, um, and have those backup plans, those contingencies in place, and always be thinking, hey, what happens if this person can't work for three weeks, or if this person gets sick? If you don't have those backup plans in place, eventually it's gonna catch up with you. Yeah, no, I think that's super important to consider. Well, Nathan, this has been a super valuable episode. I know that you are, are working on ways to educate entrepreneurs how to hire good teams and how to work with overseas contractors and things like that. Maybe talk a little bit about your next venture after your sale of free up here. Yeah, so we're excited for Outsource School. It's gonna have two components. One is an education component. Uh, we have our first course called Cracking the VA Code, our IOTA method, which we actually go through the exact process that we interview, onboard, train, and manage virtual assistants. You're gonna get not only cheat sheets on how to do it, but also screen shares of us picking four random VAs, interviewing them, onboarding them. You're gonna to get to see us training them and valuing our time so you can actually apply it in real time. And the second part of the business, which is coming out soon, is a software component. We're coming out with a lot of VA software that we've wanted to build over the past few years but haven't been able to because of working on the free up software. So we're excited for both of them. Uh, go to OutsourceSchool.com. And if you want a free tool, go to OutsourceSchool.com slash VA calculator. It's a free calculator that you put in the information of your business and it tells you how many VAs you can afford right now. Can you hire four full-time, two part-time, whatever it is. And that's really the first step to get started in hiring a VA. Yeah, definitely go check that out, guys. Nathan is someone I've known for a good chunk of time here, and he is one of the best voices in the space when it comes to virtual assistance, in my opinion. Always putting out good content. And if people want to reach out to you online, other than there, is there any other places that you would direct them to? Yeah, I'm probably one of the easiest people to contact online. You can reach out to me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Nathan Hirsch, uh, Instagram, Twitter, the real Nate Hirsch, and, and feel free to reach out, connect. If I can help you in any way, I'm more than happy to do it. Awesome, Nathan. Well, thank you for your time. And if you're looking for any of the links or resources mentioned in this episode, guys, you can find those at dannycarlson.co slash podcast. And if you haven't already, go leave a review. Really appreciate it. You guys can go to ratethispodcast.com slash DC, and it'll just open up whatever app you have on your phone and the review page for my podcast. So it makes it real easy. Appreciate all of those reviews. And until next time, guys, go out there and kick some ass. Thanks for joining us on the Danny Carlson podcast. For resources mentioned in this episode, visit dannycarlson.co.